Okay, cool. So then what do we mean by true? Okay, objectively valid. What do we mean by objectively? Okay, and fine. what do we mean by Unless abandon math, you're going to be pedantic. <laughs> I'm not. No, this is important. Oh, what's up? Rem. Yeah. Wow, that's very enthusiastic. How's it going? I'm uh, I'm okay. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Look, I know I've been taking some little pot shots. Don't worry, everyone takes this... shots at me, Rem. I don't take it personally well, at this point. It's, it's all part of the culture. it's all part of the game, Rem. What's up? It is. You got to you got to play within the system. But I mean, I have I haven't changed my position on it Good. at all. I'm glad. Right. I mean, it's it's literally the discussion I had with uh with Hassan and Irish what like a a year ago? Not a year, a year ago. Almost mm -hmm. a year ago. Um except I'm just applying it to you now. Do you think that's unreasonable? You can apply whatever standards you want. What do I think is unreasonable? Your consistency or the standards of which you apply? Um, sh both. Well, I, I assume if you think it's consistent, then well, consistency is always good. So that's a given. Obviously, it's almost begging the question. Or I agree. I would say it's always good to be consistent. Of course. Um, in terms of um, the standards you apply, um, I I don't know. It depends on the standards you apply, I guess. Um, let's <laughs> Um. Well, I, I don't. So, I mean, I was, I was, uh, I was a bit sad when you said that, like, you wouldn't read anymore. I don't know if I said I wouldn't read. I, I don't know what exactly I said. I just said reading philosophy is incredibly fucking dry. Holy no, no, you fuck! You said, uh, and so can correct me if I'm wrong. That you know, I'll, I'll never read a philosophy book again. Um, I, I might have, like, as me. I mean, I don't know if I'll ever read a philosophy book again. That's a pretty extreme statement to make. I just know that reading philosophy is incredibly fucking dry. I, I might have said that. I sure. Well, can I just, uh, as a side, it's because you read fucking Hume. I don't know why you read Hume. I've read excerpts from Kant. I've read Hume. And even Bertrand Russell's, like, quote unquote, uh, e easy or introductory book is incredibly horrible fucking writing. Like, what? Well, like, uh, horrible in what sense? And that it's horrible like, in that, like, entertaining? it's entertaining? No, not entertaining. It's just, it's structured like shit. Like, if you were to submit it in any English class, it's you would say, like, there's a million different ways you can rephrase this without it, like, reading, like, it's being written by a high school. It doesn't have a particular sentence. I, d I don't know if I, like, here's I a rule of thumb. Ready? For Destiny's Strunk and White. Okay, I came together with these two guys and I created a rule of thumb. Ready? If you have more than seven commas in a sentence, you're a shit writer. There's rule number one, okay? Oh, with oh no, no, I agree 100%. Kant is an awful writer. Here's another one. If you're using more than two semicolons per statement, you're a shit writer, okay? So that's the second one, all right? I don't think that... I, it's been a while since I read uh, Problems of Philosophy, but I don't think it's that bad. Problems of Philosophy was okay, I think, in terms of, like, being understandable. Yeah, I mean, like, Kant, is, Kant is basically incomprehensible unless you have secondaries with you i mean sure kant is legitimately a horrible writer 100 percent. i can agree with that hume isn't though hume is pretty clear it's just boring i guess i don't know it doesn't it, it, like i don't know i i don't know i would i would i, I don't know maybe i'm just not reading at that college level anymore maybe my illiteracy has just overtaken my my boomer mind as i reach these older ages <laughs> I mean, ultimately, you need to uh, uh, you need to get into to the mind frame of uh, of reading philosophy. I mean, it's like you have to definitely be in the right headspace uh, to do it. I mean, you can't just sort of like. I mean, it depends on the text, but like, I, I really think that you should genuinely read uh, Descartes' uh, discourse on method. It's it's written like a like a journal sort of of him just sort of spilling his thoughts on it, you know, having some real deep thoughts. It, it's like a, I don't know. It's very nice. It's relaxing. It's cozy. I, I genuinely think that you would enjoy it. Okay, so I'll consider I, it. Yeah, if I can get you back into reading any sort of philosophy, I would recommend Descartes' discourse on the method and then his his meditations. Okay. Um, that's where you get, you know, cogito ergo sum. Um, okay, but... I will say that you keep you keep talking about philosophical subjects. You know, like this is my biggest frustration with you when you talk about philosophy is that like we will have discussions, you know, over and over again for hours and hours where I'll, I will convince you of a position, right? And you'll be like, oh yeah, yeah, I agree. 
and then you know the next week i'll see you be calling like a certain argument like absolute dog shit. i don't or... think that's ever happened i think what's happening is i think that we agree on some parts of an argument but we still disagree on the fundamental part but then when we but then when we move on from that we agree on some other part you, you seem to think that I've all of a sudden agreed with you on the fundamental one. So, like, the, the most obvious one we can talk about is, like, the, the more realism thi thing. Where, like, you've gotten me to agree that in order to have any meaningful conversation, there must be some normative claim that precedes, like, even, like, epistemic belief. And I can probably, I think I agree with that. But I don't think that gets me into thinking that just because we require something to have a conversation means that that thing is, like, a fact of the world or, like, a real thing. Like, but you, but why? No, no. The, you, you know that's not what I mean by moral realism. What that's do you mean? I, I, I've always said that moral realism is to be defined like in a similar way to cognitivism, with b about being. About oh, that's people. fine. If that's how you agree with it, then then that's okay. But other people don't use those phrases like that. Whether you call them non layman or whatnot, usually when a, when a normal person talks about like moral realism or or, or a non academic or whatever, I feel like even academic sector, usually they're talking about the idea that like it, it moral fact exists area. in the world somewhere. It's a, ter, philosophical terms consistently change their. Okay, that's fine. Then, but we agree with how what we but just why, said. But why? But uh, why? What? Why not make that then clear to your chat when you just completely dismiss the companions and guilt argument? Because obviously, companions and guilt argument is not making any ontological claims whatsoever. It's I, not because I think that argument. I think I do. I think when I say something, I think I say something along the lines of like, "Oh yeah, like I'm aware that like Rem defines like more realism as this or blah blah blah," and like we kind of agree on that. But I don't think that it like is the same type of morality that most people are talking about when they talk about moral claims. They're not just talking about like you know needing like a preference to have a conversation about epistemic justification and that's morality like that's well okay, so, but that that's a different discussion about the sure relationship it is. between but but, no, but, but I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that when most people talk about moral realism they're talking about the idea that moral facts are a real thing a real feature of the world every time i hear somebody talking about moral realism that's what i hear them talk about it. you have a way of talking about moral realism that i don't want to say it's unique to you because i don't know but it seems to be unique to you i've never heard anybody else use it that way and in the way that you use it i think i kind of agree but just because i agree with you doesn't mean i'm about to go out and be like oh yeah you know um i'm a total moral realist now because nobody else i know uses it like you do okay well what just to be clear just so in case because i know you know but if others don't when i say moral realism i'm, I'm talking about cognitivism um uh subtracting error theory that's what i hold mean on okay real quick i'm super curious okay mm. you said just so people know what we mean when i say moral realism i'm talking about cognitivism minus error theory you know that like nobody understands what you mean when you say that right <laughs> well i but i was about to go on and elaborate on what those. oh are. sorry okay i waited a second to see if you were done with the same but okay go ahead and elaborate <laughs> right, okay so co moral cognitivism is the meta-ethical position um that basically says whenever i make a moral statement like you know you should not kill someone any statement of that type um that we can prescribe a truth value to it uh in all cases non-cognitivism argues that well no those statements are are mean potentially meaningless in a sense that we can never ascribe a a truth value to them um instead they they are for example, if you are what is called an emotivist or expressivist, you can just say that they are an expression of some desire or psychological disposition that I have towards, you know, a certain state of affairs. So me saying you shouldn't kill someone is just me. I don't like killing, killing someone, yeah. someone, right? And so I then say moral realism to di di uh, di um, distance myself from cognitivism because there's a theory called error theory which although it is cognitivist because it says that moral statements do have a truth value, um, it holds that all moral statements are, are false. There is never any moral statement that has a, uh, a truth value that is, that is not false. And so that is strictly speaking a cognitivist position, but the argument that I use to establish what I call moral realism um, objects to both or works both against non-cognitivism like expressivism or emotivism as well as error theory so that's why i and i i take this from you know academics in the field in meta ethics who use that exact same terminology so i haven't just invented the terminology it's used in a very specific section where the companions and guilt argument is, is sure going on. okay that's fine I, but i think we're already at a deeper level than i ever discuss ethics 99 percent of the time i bring them up on stream Usually when I'm talking about well, like ethics or morality, I was linked. What? the clip that I was linked was you didn't do any 
qualification on what you meant. So when someone sent that to me, it seemed very clear to me that just by that, you were talking about the moral moral realism that we always talked about. Oh, man, I think somebody specifically asked me, like, what do you think about the companions in Gilderman? I was like, oh, I don't know. It just seemed like we have like um, like semantic disagreements or something over like what is morality? Because usually these are in the greater context of like, do you think that morals are real or not? And when people talk about morals being real, we're not even on this level of deepness. Usually people are just trying to talk about like whether or not I think but that like moral fact exists like separate of like some like human interpretation or understanding of morality or whatever. But, but companions and guilt is never used in that sense. It is always an argument about truth value. Okay. Or about epistemic Sure, conditions. that's fine. That's why I never talk about companions and guilt ever. And the only time I ever have is literally one guy brought up, like, what do you think about it? And that's just what I remembered about it. Okay, and then, well, the other one is, dis you, do you still call yourself a descriptive egoist? Um, yeah, I guess so. Sure. But why? <laughs> You've acknowledged that it's a vacuous position. Yeah, it is, but all of metaethics seems pointless and vacuous to me. So, I mean, it seems like the, the most well, honest... How, but how could you say that if you literally disagree with me on, on moral realism? That I don't know what kind of moral realism you're talking about, Rem. What I don't... do you mean? I just defined it. Okay, I don't know. Then I need to go take, like, a fucking intro. You use moral realism in a way that I've never heard anybody Destiny. else ever talk about it. It's Wait, not how anybody Destiny. talks about hold it. On, hold like, on, you're, hold the, on. The, the conversation you're having is literally okay. inaccessible to people that don't have, like, a fucking Destiny. undergrad in philosophy. So, I'm, like, not Destiny. interested in it. What? I just, I, we, I literally just sat here and clearly defined for you what I meant by more. Do you think that anybody listening in either community understands clearly? I think my community did. Do you think you really? Okay, then your community it maybe but is I all underground philosophers. I'm discussion with you right now. And were you, you, did you not understand what I meant? Because if not, I'm more than happy to re-elaborate on it so that you do understand. Um, a, 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 har, partly. <laughs> Look, so, uh, okay, when you say moral realism, what do you mean by that? Hey, thanks, serfs, for raiding with the, uh, hey, thanks so much. Um, what do I, sorry. Can you yeah, when you question? say you're a moral realist, what is that, what yes. do you mean by that? Uh, when I say that I'm a moral realist, it believes that I believe that we can ascribe a truth value to our moral statements such that at least one of those statements is true. So it rules out non Okay, so can you give me an example of one true moral statement? Um, I would give, for example, well, I don't want to go too far into like the the, the, the like the normative. So web, you can't give me a single like easy, just like a clear like moral statement. Gonna, so, so the one I would immediately give to you would be something like, you know, necessary, you know, the Kant thing that we've discussed about necessary conditions for our experience and whatnot, or even the argument for like a theory of truth or whatnot, right? Because I believe that there is no division here between, you know, I know that in your mind, you, you sharply separate this domain of, um, of epistemic normativity, uh, like statements like you should behave in such and such a way. Okay, okay. You so should. you're the only way that you can get me to any true moral statements is literally to give me a necessary precondition to make any epistemic statement. Right. That, well, that I, that's I, the that's so literally the nature of all moral okay, statements. Okay. Then I, I've never heard anybody else do this before, and I don't think anybody I'm ever going to talk to. I literally don't ever have to know about this because nobody but you is ever going to bring this up. Even the other like like grad level like philosophers I've talked to have never brought up like this is their idea of moral realism. Like I've talked to like virtue ethics people or whatever. That talk about like true what they consider true moral statements i've never heard somebody say like well this is the only type of moral statement that i can make is is the idea that um because but that's it's because i'm fundamentally concerned with these meta ethical issues the the like for example um, which is the one issue that i don't care about talking about with virtue ethic i can't remember what his name was he's a nice guy right we were talking about normative ethics in that discussion Right, okay. but I'm I'm here concerned with with meta ethics because th the reason it is absolutely relevant is because there's tons of people online, especially on the Twitch platform, who are what I call these ultimate skeptics. They're everywhere. They're fucking plaguing the platform. That's fine. That's fine. You can be ultimately skeptical about meta ethics and still have meaningful conversations about normative or applied ethics. That's all I no, talk I about. I disagree with that. Well, but... that's great, but whatever. <laughs> I totally disagree. And I and I will use my whole life as an example. I think I've had a lot of great conversations about normative ethics and about applied ethics, which I would consider like political um, policies. I think we've had great conversations about it without having to do any fuck all with meta ethics. I think I can just assume that everybody's out to look for out for themselves and they can just have a conversation down that road. And more or less, my conversation is going to line up with pretty much anybody I talk to without ever having to have a single meta ethical discussion in my life okay look so we, we've strayed pretty far from the, the original point that you were making about how you had no idea what i meant by 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 moral realism you basically you basically told me that 
So we went, I, I went from asking you, well, what about descriptive egoism? You said, yeah, yeah, it's vacuous, but everything in metaethics is vacuous. I said, well, what about moral realism? Because that's an instance. You okay. literally just agree with me early. Hold on. In this call, you literally agreed with me on my companions and guilt argument to establish, you know, these certain necessary conditions that link normativity. Yes, certain... but the whole point was whether or not the, the morals, the morality that you talk about is anything remotely resembling what 99% of people say when they talk about morality. Nobody that talks about morality outside of like an, an extreme, maybe even just ethics philosophers, talks about morality as necessary preconditions for epistemic belief. You're I mean, the that's only one that's beyond that. No, 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 no. That is all the ontologist. And that is the majority of ethicists. Okay. That, that, that's how that that is usually how the ontology is like it's derived from pure reason. It is not it's not like a naturalistic conception, right? Okay, it, nobody talks about this. I don't know what to say. I don't know what you want me to say. I'll, I'll keep saying after this conversation, I'm going to say the exact same thing as I always said. Yeah, I guess I'm a more realist in the weird way that Rem says I am. But for every other purpose of conversation, I'm never going to have that conversation ever. Nobody but you is talking about that ever. N none of the conversations I've ever had with multiple grad level philosophers, with multiple political dumb fucks, everybody I've ever talked to, nobody has ever used more realism in the way that you're using it. So I'm never going to use it that way, ever. Like, it might be true that in your niche of studying ethics, even though I know that's not even what you study, maybe there are ethics ethicists that, that speak about more realism in that way but i've never heard anyone else say it before ever my entire life like that so so you so do you want me to just call it by a different name sure i guess just your what you call morality is not what anybody else calls morality ever when okay, most people so, talk okay, about morality so, okay. they're talking about things like you know like ought statements like what ought we do that's like okay, a moral good so like that refers to some moral fact i i think we're going to confuse like semantic because you're talking about moral realism which is a very specific statement about moral statements it is quite literally only about but but you're taking issue with how far i'm extending this conception of morality because... well no it's just that like it seems like for, it almost feels like at an applied level you and me actually would line up on everything but because of some weird epistemic reason you call yourself a moral realist and i call myself a moral anti-realist but everybody else that would listen to his talk would also say oh rem is a moral anti-realist anti like well, do you no, think they absolutely well so so this is the fundamental issues because I'll give this this very compelling argument to establish moral realism, right? And what is the sole purpose of this? It's to refute skepticism, right? That that is the fundamental. Okay, goal. but like, does your Hold system? On. I'm just I'm trying to explain to you. So this is it. And then I give you this argument. You agree to it. And then you ask me, okay, well now give me a moral statement that you can apply truth to. Just first off, realize that is not at all really necessary for my argument at all. Like I, it is. I could be like a. I think it's called quietism. Or, or something along those lines, where I acknowledge the truth value of moral statements without ever knowing which ones are true. Okay, here's that a question. A, Do wait, you wait, think wait, you wait, can wait. evaluate the statement murder is wrong? Absolutely, I do. So but you that think discussion? That discussion is entirely separate to the meta ethical one that we are having about what I teach. What I, what How I can you declare moral. whether or not more like murder is right or wrong without starting in meta ethics? Well, no, well, so you, that's a different conversation in metaethics, but I'm concerned about like the very uh, underpinnings of normativity itself. It's a very high level metaethical question. And again, it's to refute, do you not remember, ask yourself, that whole, that whole shtick about axioms and stuff? That's why I employ the argument and it's very successful. I mean, I literally convinced, I, I convinced, um, well, I convinced ask yourself out of uh, epistemic anti-realism or basically complete uh, skepticism or global skepticism about everything using the argument right that's why i use this argument and that is when we had that original discussion that's what i employed it for and that's what you agreed with me if we want to then go on and have a different discussion about how we actually evaluate moral statements the method by which we can determine whether a statement like you shouldn't murder x is right or wrong that's a different discussion and that is a different absolutely requires meta ethical uh justification but it but that requires questions of moral motivation uh, questions of naturalism right that's but that's a different discussion that doesn't have to do with the one that i'm having so i don't know why you keep bringing because you brought it up a ton of times okay before, then i'm, I'm just gonna keep saying the exact same thing i've always said um i guess i'm a more realist in the way that rem says i am i have no idea what that means and then for the purposes of talking to literally any other person i would say that like i'm, I'm a moral anti-realist i don't believe that there's a such thing as moral fact or that moral fact exists in the world I, like literally nothing in my position has changed but i guess i agree with you again but okay so so yes, you you are not an ultimate skeptic 
I think I am an ultimate skeptic. I don't know how you how got me out of ultimate skeptic. If, if you are a more just because something error. is a necessary precondition for what we call an experience, I don't know if that means it is necessarily like a fact or feature of the world. But skepticism, but global skepticism is not just skepticism about the existence of things, though. It's it's skepticism about knowledge itself, knowledge what? of knowing something is true or not. So if you're acknowledging that there are certain true features about the way that our mind is ordered or structured, yes, then you can't. You aren't an ultimate skeptic, right? I, are, I don't know. I, I don't know if I can know if any of those things are, are structured in such a way. I don't even know if I know how your mind well, is how structured. How can you say that when you literally have acknowledged that more, you agree with my notion of moral realism? I can agree with your notion of moral realism if I presuppose that knowledge, but I don't know if I can necessarily know that. The same way that I got have a discussion about like features of God without necessarily believing that God is real. Wait, okay, I'm, I'm, what do you mean presupposing the not, can you elaborate on that? Nope, hold on. Cause I, 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 oh I I'm, I, you've lost me now. We've sort of gone off. I'm trying to, I'm trying to understand what you mean by that exactly. Okay. What is your reputation to ultimate skepticism? Go. Um... Well, for example, if we use someone like, like, ask yourself's original position that basically says everything is basically the case that it is sort of an assumption that we make. It's sort of like a psychological assumption, or we can think of it in terms of these, these hypothetical frameworks that we pose, right? So on the one day I can have a certain framework that is, um, I don't know, um, I don't want to use a super crude example, but like I can have a, a, a framework that is basically basic logic plus some other stuff tossed in. But if on another day I can feel like, well, no, actually, I don't accept those axioms. I don't accept the, the axiom of circularity or the principle of contradiction. They are just things that we assume. None of them are actually true in themselves. How do you know that those things are true? Because, well, so this is the argument, right? Because otherwise we devolve into complete absurdity. I why is absurdity is... bad? Well, or why why can't why is absurdity something that must be avoided? So are are you an ultimate skeptic? Is that what? Yes, of course. Talking? So you would so so I could under your current system. You know my coin my coin flipping example. You would have zero objections to that. I don't know what the coin flipping example is, but what is it? So if if you acknowledge that is the case, then I could flip a coin right here, working under your current system, and just say that everything that I say is correct if I land on heads. No, what? Why? Because if that is my current system, you can't know whether my system is correct or not. What I'm, I'm saying is that just because even if using... all of humanity can come together to agree that something makes the most sense for us, I don't know if that necessarily makes it a true thing of the world. Like, I, I, don't, I can't, I can't even, I can't 100% know that. Why thing of the world? I'm not making any ontological claim. I'm not talking about the existence of things in the external world. This is all done prior to investigation about the the nature or existence of things in the external world that's it's a it's a separate investigation how, how right. do you have an investigation that's independent of the world what does that mean independent of the existence of the world and the how do you have an how do you have an investigation that's independent of the existence of the world because ultimately you can acknowledge that there's a certain way that the like this this is Kant's whole project right he investigates well what what is even necessary to have an experience in the first place so in the sense you abstract away or you you ignore the actual content that comes in through our experience, like the sense data that we like, right? All the light that we experience, the touches, the smells, we ignore all that content and we look at the structure and the things that are necessary to- uh, I don't even know if I could know what's necessary. I don't know if I could have any of that without sense data in the first place. Why not? If somebody had no sight, no vision, and no sound, and they were just born with no senses, do you think they would understand non-contradiction? Yes. How do you Five know that? Five minutes, PLS. My insomnia um, is almost cured. Like, what do you, they, are, they are still capable. Wait, no vision, no... No way of, of communicating with the external world. How would somebody like that understand causality if there are no cause and effects? How would they understand contradiction if there's nothing to be contradicted? Well, they don't even know what they're, it's they're like to still... be. As far as uh, scientifically, as far as we understand, like they are, they still have consciousness. Okay. So they're still a temporal train of thought, and thoughts are going to be occurring. Okay. And the way that we represent things, in like this is this is Kant's whole point about 
uh, space being an a priori form of, of our intuition. That space is not something that is external to us, right? Space is something that we necessarily impose upon the objects of our experience. So space no, no. isn't... I, what I'm asking is very simply, how could somebody with no sense data understand something like causality or non-contradiction, even if space and temporal, whatever because, mind shit occurs? the objects of our experience don't necessarily... What experience? Be... They're not having an experience. Yes, they are having... Ex consciousness is an experience. An experience? How, what kind of conscious experience do you have if you have no relation to the outside world? Well, you still have internal thought processes. What does an internal thought look like without any sense data? So again, I, I'm confused what uh, well, you mean by having zero sense. Yeah, that's what I'm, I'm trying to understand. If you can't see or hear anything, and you don't know language, what do your internal thoughts look like? If such that you can. If you're saying they have zero intuition, that there's there is no what we would call receptivity, so there's no data coming in. Then I agree. There's literally because the the nature of thought is is one of judgment, right? It's constant judgments about the world. And so if there's no intuition or receptivity in, a, in an agent's uh, mind, then it's, yeah, that they are not an agent. There is no experience. That's not an agent. Okay, okay here's what I'm getting at. What I'm saying so is- what, I don't understand the sure, point. Sure, the point is, what I'm trying to say is, if you have no sense data, I don't know how you can have like any type of like- But they are not a rational agent anymore. Okay, but my question is, is that, if you have no sense, it seems like sense data is a pretty important way to start establishing these truths of the world, epistemic truths or whatever, causality or deduction or anything. But well, no, the, the, no. the whole point is that we do it prior. We look at the very, like this is Kant's project. It's, it's a turn away from the external world and looking at, looking at how we, as rational agents, what is necessary in the first place to interpret anything external to us. So forget about the content of the world. The, how, like the, the colors, the, the the existence of certain objects. How could you, you look at what is even necessary in the first place? How could you know that though? If I say having sense data, what if I say having sense data is actually like the first step before making sense of anything? Like it, it is true that I mean, ideas are given rise to through the experience of sense data, but that's again, this is just okay. Wait, that's great. So then, my, yeah, sure. So then, my question would be, what if there are senses that we but don't that, have? Hold on, but receptivity makes no claim about the ontological status of things external to us. Okay, what if we had sense data such that with different types of senses, we might be able to perceive things like contradiction? In which case, the ontology of things would change if we had no. other types of so, no, so, not at all. That's impossible. Yes, well, because that is a product of the understanding, not of the sensibility. Like, but if the sense, certain, but if the understanding comes after the sensibility, no, no, they are they are dependent upon each other. I, I don't know what you mean by that. Uh, fuck. What is what's the quote by? Um, I, I I should actually like read it because it's very um, like concepts without intuition are blind. Um, yeah, without sensibility, no objects would be given to us. Without understanding, no object would be thought. Thought without content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. It is, therefore, just as necessary to make our concepts sensible, that is, to add the object to them in intuition, as to make our intuitions intelligible, that is, to bring them under concepts. These two powers or capacities cannot exchange their functions. The understanding can intuit nothing. The senses can think nothing. Only through their union can knowledge arise. That's exactly what I'm talking about. That is from. Ah, gotcha. I understand everything now. Okay. Thank okay. You. Well, no. So uh, I, I'll. So basically, Kant believes that that the nature of of the mind is one of having sensibility, and one of having understanding. So the sensibility is this intuitive um, receptivity that we have. It's like that's what you're thinking about with sense data. Right. Wait, real, can you just copy? Can you copy paste that to me so I can read that and actually understand it? No, I'm not making fun of you. It's, just, it's easier for me to read things and have them. No, read no, I, I am. I'm the same way. So okay. I'm reading something else to me is not usually that great. Let me just. Are you typing the whole thing up, or are you? No, I'm just to get the quick quote because it'll oh. come up on. Uh... Yeah, here we go. There you go. 
I'll put this on my screen. Hold on one second. I'm stream so you can see it as well. The quote is from Kant, Chris. And yes, it is from the Critique of Pure Reason. An enemy is unstoppable. Camera's blocking some of it. My bad. Let's admire me for a bit. Okay, I'm going to try to interpret these statements so that I can make sure that I understand this. Okay, ready? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Without sensibility, no object would be given to us. What that mm -hmm. statement means is that without some type of thought process, even if we, like, perceive an object, we wouldn't really understand anything. We, right? No object is given to us. We, we need some kind of thought process to make sense of our sense data. Is that correct? Right. Yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. Without understanding, no object would be thought. So merely perceiving something is not enough to have an understanding of it. You need like a thought process, something more than just the sense data, right? Right, because I mean, to call anything an object means just in a sense, subsume it under, like, you know, I interpret all yep, this sure. sense okay, data. Okay, I'm just making sure. Yeah, I'm just making sure. Yeah. Then I place it. Yeah, okay. Holy shit. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Yeah. We're looking at some Darius sense data right now. Yeah, sorry, what? I just perceive that dude out of existence. One second. Um, <laughs> thoughts yeah. without content are empty. Um, yeah. Thoughts without content are empty. When he says content, is he referring to data gathered via sense data? Yes. Okay. So thoughts without content are empty. So that means a cognitive thought process without an external world is empty. Is that, that's, no. Is that fit? no? Well, I... The issue comes with like saying because you have a certain notion of of like the external world. I do. Right? So what am I misunderstanding? Because this is starting to sound like what I just said. So go ahead, explain my misunderstanding. What do you mean? How does it so start to sound like what you just said? He said thoughts without content are empty. So a person born with no senses can't really have thoughts. They're completely empty. Yeah. That, well, that's what I agree. I said that. Okay. So we agree that a person born with no sense data has empty yeah, thoughts. Has no thoughts. Okay. Cool. Um, intuition without concepts. Are blind. What does he mean when he says intuition? Like, so intuition content. So, so intuition is literally the raw data that we get from the world. Like, imagine a computer, the inputs. Oh my god. Hold on. Is. I'm so good. I just set all that up. Oh, but our team isn't here at all, so never mind. Oh no, wait, never mind. It's good, it's good, it's good. I'm almost done with this fucking game, so I can focus more too. Sorry, hold on. Yeah, no okay, intuitions. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Oh, it's just a restatement of the same sentence. Thoughts without yes. content are empty. Intuitions without concepts are blind. Okay. Well, it is well, therefore just. Well, as no, no, it's, what? It's the. It's saying it goes both ways. Yeah. Oh, so it's the reverse of the first statement. Yeah, it, it's saying that so you can't have sensibility without understanding, and you can't have understanding without sensibility. Okay. It is therefore just as necessary to make our concepts sensible. Um. Meaning it's necessary to take sense data we have and interpret it in some meaningful he way. He explains what it is in the... That is, to add the object to them in intuition as to make our intuitions intelligible. Can you explain that? So, like, say we have the concept of a cup in our mind. Like, we, this is a concept that we have. It's not an actual bundle of, like, of, of intuitions we have. We interpret, like, all this data that we're getting from the external world, and we place it under the concept of a cup to then form the judgment well there is now a cup in front of me okay so the co the concept is not it is not like something external to us it is or the, the concept of the cup is not something external to us it is something that we then are able to reference yeah okay. to be able to judge the stuff in our the in our intuition sure hold on one sec the um to bring them under concepts these two powers or capacities cannot exchange their functions the understanding can intuit nothing the senses can think nothing mm -hmm. only through their union can knowledge arise mm -hmm. hold on this motherfucker Pascal LaRue wants to talk to me again. Fantastic. 
You know Pascal? <laughs> yeah, I know he hates philosophy. <laughs> it's really funny. Uh, it's really, really funny. Hold on. He's one of my favorite, uh, one of my, one of my favorite, uh, users of yours. He's really, really good content. Okay, I'm sorry guys, I'll know we're breaking these final turrets. Okay. The understanding can intuit nothing, the senses can think nothing, only through the union can knowledge arise. But that is no reason for confounding the contribution of either with that of the other. Rather, is it a strong reason for carefully separating and distinguishing the one from the other? We therefore distinguish the science of the rules of sensibility in general, that is aesthetic, from the science of the rules of the understanding in general, that is logic. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, you have to disagree with this, okay? You're, you're going to disagree with what I say, and then you're going to tell me why. It sounds to me like this is a restatement of what I said earlier. That I said what? earlier, so what I interpreted as what I said earlier was that we cannot have meaningful thought without content, to quote our, my good friend Khan here. That you can't have, like, uh, uh, deduction or causality without having some type of uh, no. interaction well, with the external world. Yes. That's, that's, yeah, that knowledge arises from the union of these two things. It sounded to me like you were saying that there is some knowledge that can exist independent of that experience. Yes. That's yes. sounds like, okay, so how is this quote by Kant supporting you and it sounds like it's saying the exact opposite? Because, well, it's because you have a certain uh, conception of, of, of like causality that, that he just completely... Um, okay, use something instead of causality then, some sort of other logical thing that you'd say must exist or something. Well, well, so, like non-contradiction so or something. He, Kant derives in a very like difficult probably one of the most difficult sections of philosophy ever, basically to derive what are called like the pure, like the categories of our, of our understanding, these pure categories. And these are things like, um, like causality, but these are not things that are actually found external in the world. So for example, something like space, right? It, that's not something that we get from the external world. I'm not saying that we get that. What I'm saying is that our knowledge of that arises from the union of thought and concept. That we uh, cannot have the knowledge- Temporarily? Arises temporarily? Uh, I don't know what that means. When you say like, arises- arises, arises at like, um, like genealogically as in- Okay, now I know what you mean. I, no, no, so it's like when someone teaches me like mathematics, like when someone get, like shows me four apples divides them in two and says two plus two equals mm -hmm. four yes right and then i have this sudden revelation oh two plus two equals four yeah right in that sense yes this knowledge arises through a certain experience but the knowledge itself is not dependent and this is why it's a priori this is i disagree with that the knowledge i don't think that a person that cannot perceive objects can conceive of two plus two the same way they wouldn't be able to perceive of non-contradiction. Well, but no, but this is the, I already acknowledged, this person is literally not, a, they are not a rational agent. They, they don't oh, have- Oh God, I agree with you. I agree with you, 100%. But, but, Can we the, just stop there? What? Then we agree with each other. Well, no, we don't because you are, you were, you were being the ultimate skeptic. Because it sounds like rationality, what you call rationality that must exist, otherwise it's absurd, only arises as a result of our intuitions that interact with, with objects that we deal with in an external world. Right. And my argument, my only argument was that if we had other senses, maybe another type of knowledge would arise that no. shows something totally no, no, different. No, no. no? okay. I can, tell explain, me I can explain to you why this is. Okay. Because th this is the very key point for Kant is it's about the very possibility of experience in the first place. So we're able to delve into this investigation about these a priori form, like the things that structure, like these are things, like imagine it's like a computer, right? So it gets a bunch of inputs and then the computer tries to make sense of all this, all, of all this data by imposing certain functions on it, right? These functions are not going to be changed or any different depending on what data comes in. It what? But we're saying that the functions themselves are dependent and model themselves after the data. No, no, no. Oh, no, 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 no. That, this is not what Kant is saying. Kant is not saying that... Wait, how could Kant even know this? This is the, the entire point, is that regardless of what you experience... This is my point! Pardon? This is my point! 
How, what do you mean this is your point? My point is that we can't know for sure that like what we experience or whatever is the only type of experience or that the knowledge that we have that arises between the union of our sense data and our intuitions is actually real or true. We have no way of knowing that. There could be a million other senses that we could have that would cause us to interpret this data totally differently to make no, us have like non-contradiction or something. No, no. So again, this is the point. This is what I'm trying to explain to you. Like think of it like a computer, right? This computer has a set of functions. The functions that the computer have are not going to be changed depending on what data comes in. How do you know that? How do you know that about it, humans? <laughs> because it's it's an investigation into the we consider the whole realm of possible experience that we may or may not have. But we can all right? that realm of possible experience is highly limited by our human senses. In what way? Let's say, for instance, let's say the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics was true, and we had a sense that allowed us to interpret every you single. You can't go. You can't do this because this is presupposing a ton of philosophy that has to be done after the fact, uh, after this investigation. Okay, okay. I, I don't think we're ever going to agree on this point. I, I just don't. I don't think I don't. I don't have the prerequisite background to see how you can just dismiss that entire like uh, uh, question. So I can't I can't pose to you any sense that we could have that would cause you to question this belief because you're going to say that presupposing the existence of a sense, but you're allowed to presuppose that our five senses or however fourteen or whatever give us enough information to have an accurate view of the world, and that is absolutely one hundred percent true. Well, I never said an accurate view of the world. Well, okay, it, or 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 or, or um, an understanding that there's an underlying fact of the world, like. Like, so if I if I were to be like a hardcore con, because I mean, ultimately, I'm just giving you a certain type of argument for this position like I do. But if I were to be like a hardcore con team here, I could say that it is absolutely true that we can have this what is termed this this transcendental investigation into the true nature of objects and that we can't have any actual knowledge of what the objects themselves are. Right. That is true to a certain extent. All we can know is that there is an object because it is producing within us, you know, stuff, right? But we are bounded by our experiences of the appearances that we receive, right? Okay. So I think maybe we do agree in a certain sense, but any discussion, any discussion that we possibly have on the subject is bounded by these necessary conditions for having the experiences that we do have. So you're talking about these radical skeptical scenarios of having like 14 or or 15, you know, different senses. But the whole point is that because we as, you know, human aid of as rational agents are bounded as we are, we are not, you know, infinite beings, right? We are finite beings. The notion of truth, the notion of knowledge is going to, in a sense, yes, be confined to the information that we are receiving. And also, and crucially also, the functions or the concepts that govern you know, our way of experiencing the world. But this is a refutation of skepticism how? and basically it's most if, extreme sense. I don't think, I don't understand how a skeptic wouldn't, that sounds like an embracement of skepticism that our, our knowledge is bounded by our senses. I don't think any, how would a skeptic disagree with that statement? Because they, they reject the very plausibility of truth itself of these knowledge claims. Well, of which knowledge claims? Of like, for example, saying the principle of contradiction. Yeah, well, but if you say the principle of contradiction is something that we understand due to our bounded knowledge, within the context of saying non-contradiction is a real thing within bounded human knowledge, I think even a skeptic would have to agree with that. The problem no, arises. Wouldn't. Okay, wouldn't. well then I don't know what kind of dumb fuck would say that. My, my but Ask my question, my question. Okay, I don't know about those guys. <laughs> I give you like my question. I, I actually, I, I'm, and you know, I don't even know, but I'm actually pretty sure you'd be wrong. Get the, where's the one crazy dude? Get him in here. I'm almost positive that a skeptic would say within the context of bounded human experience, non-contradiction makes sense but it's uncomfortable to say that non-contradiction must be a fact of the world must exist in the I, universe i've never said what do you mean fact of the world I'm okay wait wait, wait. so about... then do you agree that if you eliminated all of humanity that like non-contradiction might disappear that that's not actually I, like I a that if you eliminate all human beings the world doesn't exist in the first place okay I, then i have no idea what type of realism you're talking about or what that means i don't know i am i'm totally lost you keep, you're, you're very hooked on this ontological notion i must be but i'm pretty sure it's how 99 percent of everybody else like okay 
I, 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 I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna have to. You know I'm gonna have to spend a lot of time reading the SCP Wikipedia on fucking realism, I guess. Um, or but, well, you don't. There are different notions of realism, and I've, I've explained to you over and over, well, over I'm just in this with conversation Fire, what Ted. I mean by realism. So I don't understand why you keep retreating back to this ontological Wait, claim, which I've never made. I've never ever made a claim about logical principles actually being there in the external world. I'm saying that they are a necessary condition for any of our possible experiences. So when someone comes to me, like ask yourself and says, well, no, I'm just assuming it for our discussion. I say, no, you're fucking lying to me because that is an absolute necessity in having any sort of experience at all. That, that's, the, that's, that's all I've ever said. I've never made any claim about, I've never made any sort of claim about, you know, they're actually existing like logical constants in the external world. Right, I've never made that claim before. Sure, no, let's just I. let's asinine. just. I just want to read a few sentences and let's just go until we. No, because find... you're going. You're, I'm sure you're reading off of of, of a more real. Uh, that, I'm just uh, reading the the, the that domain. that Plato fucking wiki. Yeah, because the the understanding that you have of like moral realism is unlike anything. Do you want me to? Do you want me to actually consult the actual literature on this subject about you know the companions and guilt argument? I can bring up for you where moral realism is. You, if, if yeah, you, I would love. I would actually yes. I would actually be curious because the okay. statement that you gave me by Kant seems to support everything that I just said. And 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 now you're saying, well, oh, hold on, hold on. Okay. Okay, what I know that what Condra said seems said. to support what you said. That the idea that knowledge arises at the union between sense data and 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 mental intuition. That you that you need those two things together in order to do it. Whereas earlier, now I would have to no, go no, back in the vibe. Or, okay, hold on. I'm super curious. Support. Wait, wait. I I just want to see what Chad thinks of this because I'm because I don't know if I'm missing something because I'm too heated because I just played a league game or what. But it sounded to me earlier, and Chad, you guys tell me if I'm right or wrong. It sounded earlier like Rem said that actually a person born with no senses would still understand things like non-contradiction, would still understand things like deduction and logic. That, well, it sounded no, like no. that's what you were saying earlier. No, no, because I thought you were restricting ourselves like to just um, like sight, sound, and ability to communicate with the outside world. But for example, there are internal processes that take place that are, in a sense, like a type of of sense in a very like loose sense. Of like the word. what? Like, that as well. Like a, like an internal, an internal like in a feeling of an emotion, for example. What? Or, okay, but no, 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 no. Hold on. Let's be very clear on this, okay? I'm talking but about if you, if you all saying there's no receptivity, then absolutely there. When you say no person. receptivity, does that mean a sense that conveys data or, or gathers data about the external world? That's what I'm talking about. If you have no sense data of the external world and you've never had sense data of the external world, what I'm saying is you would not have these things that you say are clearly very real because they're necessary preconditions for human experience. I'd say, well, actually, I don't think humans that haven't gathered sense data can have would, would agree with this at all, that they don't believe in things like non-contradiction or deduction. Well, but you can't even talk to these people in the first place. That's exactly my point. So but you, they, you could... Are, it, no, no, but literally because they are not rational beings, they are not... A, they're, it's like talking you do, to a You're rock. playing a... Pre, you're tautologically assuming rationality, though. You're saying, oh, well, this is what rational... What do you mean, tautol that's a definite... This is, you're, what, you're, you're, you're saying about? that rationality is... What do you mean? It's a definition. Of course, it's analytically true. It's not tautological. Be well, because you've defined rationality in a way that I can't possibly disagree with, and then it must be real, I guess. If rationality is defined as... But that's our saying that you... Why are you defining red as that, of a, as this certain... Because that, that's literally what that means within our society. What is... What are you talking about? Okay, here's... Okay. A very here's a simple question. Do you think it's possible that non-contradiction could be experienced by people with alternative senses? Uh, I, I can't even, like, that is just a completely meaningless question to ask. Because it's because unfathomable? I, yeah, it's literally unfathomable. I agree! So That's the that skepticism. Means. That's it. But no, but but you cannot then prescribe any sort of truth value to that statement, Destiny. Sure, you would be, sure. It's like asking, blah, 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 blah. It's literally asking me that, because it literally means nothing to me. You're asking something that is quite literally incomprehensible at all so to ascribe any sort of truth value to that and saying oh well yeah that is a possibility is ridiculous sure it's unfathomable but this is place. but the problem is that you're backing into an area similar to this to establish some very fucking weird notion of morality in order to come meet some weird notion of morality. all i'm establishing is the truth value of moral statements that's it but the truth value of those moral statements relies on the statement that like our sense data is conveying something that can only be like the, the, the reality of the world or whatever. That that like you you're trying to say that No, that's wrong. That is wrong. It is not about the sense data ha because look, again, it's saying regardless of what our senses interpret, regardless of what the external world is actually like, our experience and the way that we interpret our experience is always like again this is the computer example right we have set functions in the computer you don't know that 
Oh my goodness. I mean, I, I, we've just gone through this. Okay, yeah. Right? Let's talk about the computer example then. That's a great example. I like that one. Let's use that, okay? So I'm going to explain your example so that you can tell me if I'm getting it right or wrong, okay? Okay. So um, <clears throat> let's say that um, <clears throat> let's say that I have. Um, uh, uh, fuck, I'm trying to... Tr okay, I'm not going to use specific things. We have some internal functions in our computer, okay? Some code or programming. And then we, we attach to this computer some number of modules. And these computers gather data about the external world. And that when they gather this data, that data is always ran through these internal list of functions. Is that essentially what you're saying? Sure. Okay. Now, I could be wrong, or maybe I'm misinterpreting... The, the, the con that you just read me, but it sounds like these functions can exist independently on their own, like what you're trying to say. These functions don't exist on their own. That that rather like it it has to be like the union of the external objects plus our intuitions that ever have these things arise. That we can't say that these exist independent of sense data. No. So again, but again, this is this is the this is the issue is because you have this notion that the nature of the functions is going to be shaped by by this the set of data that is coming in, which you agreed with. No, I did not. Agree you with told that me that a person again, with no oh. sense data is not a rational agent. Rational course, agent that, in no, my no, no, mind no, no, is no, like having on, these functions. On. Okay, go. Hold on, because that's a rejection of any sort of input mechanism in the first place. We denied them the 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 um. Fuck, what's it called? The, um, starts with the C, the, Conscious? like, the capability, capability, the, pardon? I don't, what, what are you like saying? The cogn oh, the faculty, thank you. Uh, the, the faculty of sensibility, that is what you're rejecting to them. We are not rejecting that they, you know, that they, because if they don't have any sense data, period, then it seems like, are, are we, this is why I'm, I'm very, I'm sort of confused about the example and why we then have to get into, like, a nitty gritty sort of i guess a sort of scientific investigation into what what is sense data right but i mean if you are just saying that someone does not have sensibility does not possess the faculty of sensibility then absolutely they are not a rational agent kant literally says there that we need but then doesn't that mean that your internal functions aren't your internal functions then shaped in some ways by the sense data that you gather how how do you reach that conclusion the set because look we have the faculty of sensibility this is a process by which, like, it is. We only know that we have that faculty in the first. We place. only know that once the data is there, though. Like, we of don't know course, if the data it, that we gather is shaping that faculty. Like, maybe if we found a way to give somebody a totally different set of like senses or whatever, maybe that internal faculty would be shaped entirely differently. Okay, uh, maybe maybe the computer uh, example is just not. Um... It's not a great uh, example. Maybe it's just confusing. Okay. Uh, confusing you. Uh, I I don't really know how to go go into this, but again, so the the very investigation into um into you know these types of 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 statements about how the human intellect absolutely necessarily has to function is of course bounded in a sense by our limited finite. Capabilities, yeah, but I acknowledge right? that. But, I'm just but, saying but, that. But, 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 but this means that by the very nature of this, that we can never talk outside of this. I agree. So any discussion, any discussions that we ever have are confined to this. So when but my problem is that it questions... feels like you're making a statement that nothing can exist outside of that. That's what it because, feels like. Because because the very notion, these very notions that you're bringing up, you've acknowledged that it makes no sense to talk. Because we're not capable of it, but that doesn't mean that nothing can exist outside of our bounded knowledge. No, that doesn't make sense. You can't say that we are at the same time incapable of saying anything about, you know, these magical beings that have 14 senses while saying at the same time that we can't say that they don't exist. You're, right? It I'm feels like your statement, their existence. but you are. You are making a claim. No, no I'm not. Your statement saying, is almost I, begging I my conclusion. You. You're literally saying we have bounded knowledge, implying that our knowledge is bounded out from some no, external thing. Me. I'm saying that it's a meaningless question to ask in the first place. I agree. So that's that why I don't deal with meta-ethics. <laughs> that's no, why. Meta-ethics is engaged within... <laughs> Metaethics is literally investigation bounded within our experience. So you can't go and object. But metaethics theory. seems to make some claims about things outside of our bounded experience. Like That's my what? part. Like the idea that something is like absolutely true or absolutely real 
or, I, or maybe I'm just defined within our bounded experience destiny. Okay, and I agree that there can be truths defined within our bounded experience. Sure. What do you mean truth defined with? There can't be truth outside of it. Well, listen, I don't think there's a meaningful way to interpret the statement "murder is wrong." Okay, that's all I'm saying. Okay. But, so, but you can't just like you know cop out here at the end. You literally just made a. You literally just acknowledge the truth of what I said by saying that you agree that we can literally say nothing outside of our yeah, of course. outside of our experiences, mm -hmm. right? So, but how does how does this have anything to do with meta ethics and the? the well, the let's find out, Rem. I want to I want to say murder is wrong. How do I interpret that statement? Get me there Again, from the beginning. I, I literally hold on. Why are you doing this gotcha thing? I'm, I'm not doing. It's, it's not a gotcha on, thing. No, wait, wait. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. Hold on, hold on, hold on. I, I don't want a gotcha statement. I just want you to show me how to parse a moral statement without your moral statement being. Well, the moral statement I'm saying is that the presupposition for any type of epistemic statement. Yeah, I just want to get to a normal moral statement. Go. Did you not listen to the explanation I gave to you earlier about how the question I'm concerned with is a refutation of skepticism? The question of how we go about evaluating moral statements is a completely separate question, Destiny. So quit conflating the two and trying to do a getcha by saying that if I'm I not trying to do a gotcha, I just wanted to ask the question. It's irrelevant because I don't why think you, that you're you refutation. Because I think that your refutation of skepticism doesn't have anything to do with morality and the way that morality is ever used. That so these are questions of epistemic belief. So this is an ep epistemological or maybe even an ontological discussion. Okay, so now we've, we we pivoted again from the original question because you originally said that meta ethics as a discipline which is concerned with normativity oh okay, hey guys like, smile that they are all completely when you say that meta ethics claims. when you say that meta ethics is concerned with norm concerned with normativity are you, do you sure do you mean to say that like for instance like would you agree with the statement that no normative statements can exist without some type of moral statement behind them or something like so, for instance, if I were to say, like, in order to fill a glass up halfway full, I would need to, um, I would need to fill a glass to its halfway point. If in order to fill a, a ten milliliter glass halfway full, I need to pour in five milliliters of liquid. Does that like normative statement require some form of morality behind it? Um, yeah, I, I would say yes. Because How? I, I, Sorry, you were about I, to answer. I, I just cut you off. Go ahead. Yes, I know. We, I've already, I've already explained to you that I do have this concept of morality. It's a pragmatic one. It comes from the pragmatic school that. No, that I believe in what is called the normative web, that there is no distinction to be made between epistemic normativity and ethical normativity. They function in the exact same way. Tr the truth and the good are just, in essence, the exact same thing. They are two sides of the same coin, right? So, so your definition of good is just things that are true? How, how, connect those two for me. I mean, a, a notion of true, I, well, hmm, I, I, do we wanna have a whole separate discussion about you know theories of truth or something? I'll just, I'll just buy into your theory of truth and then go for it. Tell me how goodness okay, well, is true. An example would be that uh, something is true if and only if it serves a certain uh, pragmatic end, like, um, fuck, what's his name? It's like a Persian conception. So we can what is a pragmatic almost, end? What does that mean? It, it's something like maximizing utility. For okay, example. so literally your definition of good would would obviously subsume every single normative statement then because of filling course. a glass halfway full but nobody ever uses good like this except for maybe i guess philosophers nobody would say that oh well, well good things why, are just on. things when that, that having, assume some pragmatic on, when, end well we are having a discussion about the very nature of truth and the very nature of good why the hell are we appealing to the commonplace public about what we're trying to analyze because no one because that's what this whole conversation person, started most, with this whole what? conversation started with you coming on here and saying, Destiny, you run around telling people that you're an anti-realist when it comes to morality. And then I say, right. well, yeah. And then, we got and to then the you, bottom of that. And, yeah. 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 And then yeah. you say, well, actually, Destiny, you agree with my position. It's like, well, yeah, in some really roundabout way, I kind of Hold do. On. No, no, let, let's but be clear about how this discussion occurred, right? We, we we found out that we actually agree with each other on comparative guilt. We know there's, that. We've gone that. over this a million times, Rem. Hold on. If I can. If I can yeah, okay. sorry. Go ahead. And and so then we agree that we, so we agree on that, okay? It was just a semantical issue about what we mean by moral realism. And then I asked you about why you believe in descriptive egoism even though it's vacuous you said yeah it's vacuous but every -E minute oh man -E hell yes okay right so that's what i'm taking issue with and then you said well everything is essentially vacuous and then you took this ultimate skeptic stance which you've now retreated from i haven't no i am an ultimate skeptic but i think an ultimate skeptic would agree that humans can have conversations within their bounded intelligence but things might exist outside of those bounded senses that may or may no, not change hold everything on. go ahead hold on you can't say that because you've acknowledged that things external to our experience cannot be spoken about
right? You acknowledge that those questions are meaningless. So you cannot at the same time say that and also say that, well, that thing may exist. Because you can't, you can't wait, describe so any can I say, wait, wait, that is meaningless. Can I say something like a god might exist or some immaterial plane might exist? Am I not allowed to make those statements? I have well, I mean, to be that, absolutely that resolute. That can literally govern our external world. There are conceptions of godhood that exist that that aren't, you know, that don't literally transcend our individual. Okay, what well, I'm talking about, I very clearly I said immaterial. Is it is it unreasonable for me to say something like, "Wow, an immaterial plane might exist that never interacts with our physical one"? Can I not make that I, statement? That well, that well, no, I don't think you can because it absolutely <sighs> okay. transcends any sort of uh, sort of. But so what? So I have to. So what? Theories like that. There's always some sort of causal connection. So do I have to say? Sure, so do I have to say then that they don't exist or? No, you can't say anything about it at all. It's a meaningless spiel. It, 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 it transcends the bounds of human experience. It's it's completely meaningless. So why bring it up in the first place as any sort of refutation? It's like saying, well, no, you can't know it's red because, you know, there could be a Because I'm bringing it up as a refutation. Being. Because I would bring it up as a refutation if somebody says, ah, an ethereal plane doesn't exist and can never exist. And then I would well, counter no, that so with saying, well, the, hold on, you, we can't you really... You justified your usage of descriptive egoism on the basis that there is, that it is possible. So you justified this meta-ethical position, which is, I guess, well, it's not, well, yeah, no, it is. I would say it's meta-ethical, okay? Um, you justified this meta-ethical position, uh, despite saying that it's vacuous, by saying that, well, all positions in meta-ethics are vacuous because we can never know absolutely for certain that, you know, these things that govern our knowledge are 100% certain. And then, but to justify that, you then have to appeal to something that transcends our bounds of experience, which is, of course, something that you've literally just rejected in doing. You literally said we can't appeal to something external to us because it's completely meaningless, that we are bounded by our human experience. So you can't use this vac this vacuous, uh, uh, you can't deny uh, that you can't use descriptive egoism uh, just because all other meta-ethical theories are vacuous also, because they aren't vacuous. Okay. I right? don't know how that's a reputation of anything I said earlier, but listen. I want you to interpret the statement, murder is wrong. I need you to get me there. Just walk me there, Rem, please. <laughs> Humor me, please! <laughs> No, I'm, I'm not. Can you give me to one real moral statement epistemic. that doesn't have to do with epistemic truth? Just one moral statement uh, that something is right or wrong. That I'm having with you, Destiny. I I'll whip out Parfit one day and we can go through on what matters if you want. Okay, I'm not. That's not what I'm here to discuss with you. Okay. I'm here to discuss with you, for example, descriptive egoism. Uh -huh. You say that descriptive egoism is it's fine that it's vacuous because every other meta, meta ethical position is vacuous. But now you seemingly acknowledge and you've pivoted away from this idea that they are vacuous. <laughs> I haven't you pivoted away from vacuous. anything. I then, then have how, the, all still the still same beliefs I had before. What? That meta ethics is vacuous? Yeah. You Fucking A. Vacuous. Hell yeah, I do. Then how are they vacuous? Explain to me again. Do we have to go through the exact same cycle again where you appeal to, well, we can't know for absolutely certain because there could be a 25 cents. Yep, I still there. agree with that statement. But then you also agree with the statement that we can't actually say anything that would possibly transcend our human experience. So you can't say that at all, in fact. And you can't appeal to the- We can still make state- I think we can make statements within our bounded human experience while still acknowledging that things exist outside the bounds of human experience. No, you can't. Oh, you can't well, do that, Destiny. I, I'm fucking- I'm so tiny-brained. Or- Either I have a small brain or maybe I have the extra sense that allows me to perceive this and the knowledge that arises yes, from the union you, so of my saying, concepts and saying, mind <laughs> transcend you, yours. You not, you're saying that you can make a meaningless, you can make a, a claim that has meaning about something that is completely meaningless. Is that what you're saying? Sure. Because it's complete logical contradiction that you're making here and you're not backing down from it for some reason. You're usually very good at backing down from things that are like clear as day contradictions, but you're not for some reason. Okay, here. what do I, I'm sorry, talk, what do I need to back down from? Because you acknowledge yeah. that we can't ever say anything Meaningful. about something that transcends human experience. Sure, I agree with that. Okay, then you make the claim that we can make, that we can say that something does exist that transcends human experience. I don't know if that is true. No, I would say we can't have knowledge of things. It's what I always say, we, that we don't well, really okay, know. Okay, so yeah. there you go. Because it doesn't even make sense to talk of existence of something that transcends human experience. Okay. We can't ascribe any sort of predicate to it. We can't say that it's red. We can't say of course, that it's yeah. We can't say that it's true. Okay. So to say that all meta-ethical theories are vacuous, because in effect, it, it could be that they are some completely other way because there are other beings that might interpret the world in a completely different way that is completely unlike ours. I guess it just feels to me, and maybe I missed it that. all, it feels to me like claims of meta-ethics rely on some sort of generation that is completely divorced from observations we can make about the world. And This that's... is a completely separate argument. Okay. It's a, so, you've now, so you acknowledge that the argument that you've made 
full time is wrong. I I I don't. I honestly don't know. How do you like <laughs> let, let, let like seriously? Let's truly go through this so that we can really get on the same page. So we can here. real. Okay, hold on. I got the notepad. I got the notepad yeah, yes, out. Let's out. Be super All right. Here. The notepad is out. Academic. Let's do some real academic notepadding. Hold on. Okay. Okay. New. I'm gonna do a rich text document. All right. New. Wow. Okay. Pulling out the full stops here. Philosophy with Remlord. Okay, that's your name. Okay. We're gonna up the font great. size here. It's a 20. Okay. Now, what are, what are we talking about? Uh, okay. okay. You make the statement that I I am a descriptive egoist. Okay. Okay. Why do I we have to start to with there? Pardon? Okay. Why are we starting with this? Well, because this is just the train of conversation. Because I'm objecting to that, and then you say, hey, "Well, I object to that on the basis that that is a vacuous claim." And you know, and you've acknowledged that. You say, "Yes, it is vacuous." Okay. Hold on. Let me think. I got to think about all my statements now. Okay. Um. We're gonna think real hard about this. Okay, descriptive egoism. Okay, mm -hmm. this is good. So I say, okay, hold on. Why do I like? I'm not even sure if it's descriptive egoism or psychological egoism. It's one of them. Whatever the meta one is. They're okay, the same thing. Are yeah. you sure? I feel like one. I thought one was a normative ethics and one was a meta ethics, but no, that's okay. Ethical egoism is the normative one. Psychological. Oh, okay, fuck ethics. Okay, you're right. Okay, fuck it. Okay, so. <clears throat> It's a claim about like the nature of humanity that all actions that we take are self-serving. Okay, I say this is good because it accurately conveys how people derive ethical statements, but I acknowledge that it is somewhat vacuous. Right, because it is sense it just it talks past the person who is an altruist. Right, I've given the argument for this before, and you you said it on it's stream even. It, okay. And then you say, if it's vacuous, it sucks. Or something. What is your... <laughs> yes. And because it's not good because we can have meta-ethical claims or meta-ethical systems that aren't vacuous. Correct? Oh, right. Yes. Okay. Okay. We're going to let's begin here. Okay. I reject meta ethics because fuck that. I have a system called, or the system that I prefer, is something called descriptive egoism. Basically, things are good because people feel they're good and people just like basically try to maximize for their own self interest. So they invent meta ethical ways to describe this. But in the at the end of the day, people just do what they feel best serves themselves. They're whatever personal like feelings or preferences that they have, they just try to satisfy those things. And everything is is post hoc justified. Now you're telling me, well, actually, we can have meta ethics that's better than that. So hit me up. Okay. Well, I've given you the example. I I mean, you took a bunch of mm -hmm. uh, issues with like so an area, a branch of meta ethics is an investigation into normativity. So examples. Christine Korsgaard. Okay, hold on. Know. Now, this is something that I want to... Okay. Is this... Uh, is this a statement that academics in the field of ethics are agreement are in agreement with? That, I mean, we can go to fill papers right now and check out, like... That normativity, normativity. requires meta-ethics. Well, it's... It, I mean... That that's I don't know if I don't know what normativity would strictly... Yeah, it's it's a branch of what is called value theory. Does everybody theory. agree with because this is a big part of your argument and it's something that I reject. I don't think that so so for an example, a normative statement like um in order to run the hundred yard dash, I need to run one hundred yards. You're saying that that type of normative statement requires meta ethics. Yes. Okay. How? Well, I already explained to you that I think Yep, we're doing it all again because I'm too slow to keep up with the argument. So we're doing it all again. How does that statement require meta ethics? I've already I already said to you that I believe that, you know, the truth and the good are really just two sides of the same coin. Okay. So normative statements um can can be evaluated to be true or false and true equals good. Um therefore 
or, or, or rather truth statements are a statement about good or not good. Therefore, normative statements require metaethics. Is that a fair statement? Sure. Okay. So, okay, boom, we're breaking out this. Okay. Why does true equals good? Why, how is that? Why? Um, well, because if we look, for example, at theories of truth, and I look at the competing theories of truth, for example, like a correspondence theory of truth, a coherence theory of truth, an identity theory of truth. The question that then has to be asked is, well, why ought I subscribe to a certain theory of truth? Oh, my God. What? Nothing. So I, it's just something I, it has to be wrong, but I have to think for a while about why it's wrong. So you're telling me that Theories of truth exist for me to choose a theory of truth. Well, I have to choose one, and mm -hmm. therefore that choice requires metaethics. Well, look, I, I certainly, I, I, just like you, I certainly don't think that a theory of truth is out there in the in, in the external world to discover. So it has to be a rational choice. I no, no, wait, okay, wait, yeah, sure. Let's 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 we'll do this then. Okay. So why does true equals good? So true equals good. Because a theory I mean, it's of not truth that simplistic. It's more like it's it's more like they're two sides of the same coin, but they aren't equivalent to each other. Okay, you're saying true is good because a theory of truth requires a preference to choose it. That preference is is somehow rooted in meta ethics. Right. It's rooted in it, it's rooted in a normative consideration. Okay. Wait, no, no. You can't say it's rooted in a normative consideration because we're trying to establish that normativity requires metaethics. We can't say right now that it already, because I'm still trying to build up why does normativity require metaethics, and now you're saying, well, normativity requires metaethics because for us to choose a theory of truth, we need normativity, and that requires metaethics. You, we, we're circular now, which is vacuous, which is the whole reason we didn't like descriptive egoism. I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what you mean. I'm at, okay, so... You said normativity requires meta-ethics, yes? Mm -hmm. And I'm saying, and you said the reason why is because normative statements can be evaluated using uh, true or false, right? Mm -hmm. And then in order to evaluate something as true or false, you need a theory of truth. And in order to pick a theory of truth, it requires normative statements, well, and no, those so normative but, statements require meta-ethics, so we're, it's a big that, circle. You do, no, but you recognize that like my position in a sense, it collapses these disciplines into, like, I don't, I think you have this perception of me that everything is sort of like, like, like a ladder or something where it's like a pyramid. Yes, of course. One, yeah. No, absolutely. I absolutely reject. Oh, okay. Pyramid. Hold on. Hold on. Okay. Let me, I might understand this so better. So instead of, so I, so I'm saying I see things as being built up as a pyramid, but you see like one concept leads to another and leads to another that might lead back to the original concept, right? It's, it's a, it's like a web or like a circle. No, it's like a web. <laughs> what? Also circle, but I, that's not a bad thing. Wait, if it's circular, then it's vacuous. No, 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 no. You, no, no, because ju it's not justification. You literally are, you're saying that meta, that normativity requires metaethics. And the reason why is sorry, because- are you, are, you tr are you freaking the fuck out at a notion of, of holism? Well, why can't I, I have you, holism I, with I, descriptive I egoism on, then? Hold on, hold on. I, I like I understand that you you have this notion of circularity in your mind and yes. you're freaking the fuck out about it. Yes. But I I can just tell you that this conception of the way that philosophy is structured is the predominant theory in philosophy. I think like seventy percent of philosophers ascribe it's like it is really a form of like all naturalist philosophers, for example, agree with this kind of picture of philosophy. So that I know you're freaking out about this, but I it is not what you are, I think, thinking it is. Okay, it sounds to me then, if things can be circularly justified, or if we have all- But no, no, it's not about justification. It's about, for example, recognize, like for example- Okay, wait, let's just keep on, going. No, no, okay, yeah, me, go ahead. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, go so for it. Can understand. So when I'm talking about like brain states, for example, like neurological pictures, sets of neurons or whatever, okay, that's, that is one domain, okay? Then I have another domain, like the psychological domain, you know, states of belief that I have. I believe that this thing is red, yada, yada, yada. Um, it's not circular to then say, well, these two things are actually like even perhaps isomorphic to each other or are actually just identical with each other. That's not circularity. That's just an analysis of the contents of both disciplines and recognizing that they are in a sense, um, you know, uh, 
not necessarily identical with each other, but collapse into one okay, theory. Okay, what I'm asking is, when you say good, so like, if I say the Holocaust that's happened- that's circular, I just want to say. Sure, if I say like the Holocaust happened, you would agree that that statement is true and good. It is good to say that it is true. It is good to say that it is true. But if we were to evaluate like the Holocaust itself, as, as whether or not it's good, would you just look to see like if it was true or if things that happened in it are true? No, no. So th this is the thing. When I'm choosing a theory of truth, okay. okay. When I am choosing, or maybe truth, truth is a bit more complicated, just because of how uh, complicated some. But if we want to say like um, a theory of, what's a good one? Um, what's an easy one that I can? Okay, here, here, like a theory of probability, for example, like, you know, like frequentism, Bayesianism and stuff, you know, are you familiar with this? Um, hold You've on. talked about statistics, I think, before. Wait, sorry, yeah, what, like Bayesian infantry, like building up, like, inferencing, sorry, like, like building like, up, like, like, competing like... theories of probability, like a Bayesian. Yeah, sure, or... you take some a priori belief and then you start applying right. things and then you adjust your Bayesian probabilities based on whatever, yeah, what about it? Well, so there are multiple competing theories of of probability okay. in the philosophy of probability. Okay. Okay. And it's not a fact of the world about which theory of probability is correct, right? That would be, I think, be the way that we ought to choose. When I say that this theory is correct, right? Um, there's some rational standard by which we need to apply this question to. So when I I, I I'm posed with these different options about which um, theory of probability I ought to choose, the decision of which one I ought to choose is, is a normative one. I need to choose one on the basis that, you know, doing so is going to suit a given set of ends, and these ends are, have to be good, right? So No, I, well, that, you just, you snuck, you, good just kind of showed up in there. <laughs> like, well, of course, it's a normative consideration. I don't think most people use good that way. I don't so even no, think most I'm philosophers use good that way. What, what do you mean? Just what I said. I feel like good is generally referring to moral statements, not like satisfies a condition as being good. I don't think most people use it that way. I, I, I look, I, I've told I like I take this prag pragmatic worldview that ethics is really at the root of everything. Right. Well, so, yeah, that's convenient for you when you're trying to make this argument. But I don't what know do you mean if it's convenient for me. This is what my position has always been. It's literally the root of the companions and guilt. Okay, okay. Test. Let's keep going down the ladder. Okay. That's really a web, the web ladder. Okay. So I asked, why does true equals good? You said that true is good because a theory of truth requires a preference to choose some theory of truth, correct? Sorry, can you repeat that? So you said that true is good because in order for us to even talk about true, we need to have a theory of truth. And in order to pick a theory of truth, we need to express some preference towards a particular theory, right? Right, not preference, obligation. Why does it have to be an obligation? Well, because it, wait, 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 hold on. That's another question. Yeah. Let me break it out. Okay. In order to choose a theory of truth, we need to have an obligation question mark to said theory we choose. Why do we need we ought to be rational? That's that that statement is vacuous. Of course, we what do ought you mean to be vacuous. Well, we ought to be rational. Colleges, absolutely. Wait, is there any other statement you could ever make besides the statement we ought to be rational? I, there, I know people that will say that rationality is not the thing we need to care about, so. How? I, I don't know. Can we agree ask, ask that yourself. anything outside of rationality would be absurd? I thought we agreed on this earlier. Right. No, I agree. Okay, so we ought to be rational is not a justification for doing anything. Because well, you can't well, say no, that obligations that's... are rational because now you've just literally presupposed your entire fucking argument. Like... I'm asking, where does an obligation come from to pick a particular theory of truth? Why do we need an, or what do you mean when you say obligation? Maybe I might misunderstand when you say obligation. What do you mean by obligation? Like an obligation in so far as, like, for example, uh, if we go back to Kant, right, and we talk about these necessary forms, okay. for example, right? Uh, if we take, for example, something like the principle of contradiction, okay. we ought to, on a day-to-day -day basis, employ this and ensure that we are operating by the principle of contradiction when we are trying to derive certain uh, state uh, truths about the state of affairs of the world or, well, whatever content you want to be involved in those judgments, right? So it is like <clears throat> we are governed by the principle of contradiction, but 
to essentially go against our own rationality, which is possible. Okay, why can't I? Why can't I literally plug descriptive egoism into that? We ought to adhere to rationality. Then I say, well, of course, the descriptive egoist agrees with that because in order because to maximize our theory. What and what is what is Destiny, we've, you've acknowledged that there are certain necessary things that we're bounded by in human experience. What, then where does our ought to for adhering to rationality come from? It comes from the fact that we like this is the very basis of our cognitive systems, but we are finite beings. So we are not necessarily always going to be able to reflect the true nature of the way that the world or our mind we could is act irrationally, though. Why do we choose right? rationality over irrationality? Did you not literally just tell me how it's what a stupid question that would be? Yeah, but now I'm curious what your answer is. Oh my fucking god! Because I have one. Because I would say because it doesn't fill our preferences. Of course, we ought to uh, uh, adhere to rationality or irrational. Irrational oh people step god. off of buildings and and expect to fly. So I would say, of course, we ought to be rational because it adheres. Wait, maybe I am a moral realist, but my moral realism just comes in the form of descriptive egoism, Rem. You got, because I would say that that preference is there for rationality. Except mine is rooted in necessity and yours is rooted in some heteronymous sort of Necessity you... for what, though? Necessity, necessity to satisfy your personal preferences. The, I did the on, Scooby no. thing. I unmasked the villain, Rem, and you are, you are fake news. You're descriptive egoism, Rem. Destiny, Destiny, you agree that there are mathematical truths, right? I don't know. What do you mean by truth? We, don't, we haven't picked the theory of truth yet. We have to start somewhere. So you acknowledge that there are mathematical truths, yes? I need to know what you mean by truth. Would math exist if all of humans were destroyed from the universe? I don't know. I don't think it would. I don't think math is a fact of the world. I don't think math exists. I don't either. Okay, cool. So then what do we mean by true? Okay, objectively valid. What do we mean by objectively? Okay, and what do we mean by math? abandon math, you're going to be pedantic. <laughs> I'm not. No, this is important because you're literally. Because if I answer yes to this, then we can presuppose. I can walk down. You don't have to hold my hand through the rest of the argument. We presuppose mathematical truth. Of contradiction. Okay, the principle of contradiction. Sure. Okay, you agree it's a necessity. A necessity for what? Human experience. No. Because people without senses can have some oh. kind of experience, but they might not have non-contradiction. You're just fucking with me. I'm not, Rem! Somebody, could, you, wait, do you acknowledge that it's possible that somebody could be born no, with no, no. Would you? those aren't people to you? Though? Oh, wait, you're, you're li to they're literally not human people. beings. Destiny, you literally told me, okay? You told me to transcend the bounds, to speculate beyond the bounds of human experience is meaningless. And now at the same time of claiming that, you're trying to make a claim about something beyond the bounds of human experience. I don't think it's beyond the bounds of human experience. Somebody can be born without external senses. Well, no, hold on. Born without sensibility. I've already acknowledged that. Yeah, that knowledge arises at the union of sensibility they're, they're and intuition. They're not agent. They don't have faculty. So it's, it's an irrelevant. Of course they don't. It's like asking, does a rock have understanding? No. But if you're talking about some deity that has 25 fucking senses... I can't say anything about that. It transcends okay. our human experience. We're getting so off the main point. We're getting an answer to this, Ram. Why ought we adhere to rationality? Because the very nature of rationality itself is about the necessity that governs any sort of thinking at all in the first place. Right? I don't it know is, what you mean by that. Can you break that statement down for me? <laughs> it is necessary that we have, for example... Uh huh. The principle of contradiction it necessarily governs our ways of thinking correct okay okay so the content that we receive from the world okay mm -hmm. whatever content that may or may not be we interpret it but in, under no circumstances can there arise a certain type of contradiction within our mind concerning the content of the world sure but i don't know where an ought comes from there it almost sounds like you're making like a descriptive statement at that point like this doesn't the ought come from the fact that we are finite beings and we are not always purely capable of recognizing like the fact that you know Kant had to spell out spell this all out right in a huge fucking okay here phone. Hel help me with this because I don't understand this why are you not making a descriptive statement right now when you say that like humans ought to adhere to rationality because it sounds like you're just saying like humans can only be rational isn't that just a descriptive statement you're we're not we're not talking no, about no, more no 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 okay. the ought comes from this is what I'm saying it comes from the fact. Mm -hmm. That we as humans are finite beings and we are not always capable of inquiring into the true nature of, you know, the structure of human experience. Right. So on a day to day basis, I can I can 
might have this belief that the law of contradiction is something that is, you know, false. Okay, you're right? saying a lot, but all I'm hearing is we ought to adhere to rationality because we are rational beings. Well, of course. But I mean, isn't that, that just that a descript? Where is the, there's, that's not really an ought statement though, right? Isn't that just a descriptive statement? No, no, the ought statement is about how we as human beings ought to conduct ourselves through the analysis of the necessity. But aren't you literally our deriving experience? like an ought from an is here? Like because humans are rational, therefore no, 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 we no, ought no, no. to be rational? Like the ought claim, the obligation, and again, this is where the goodness and the truthness sort of con they Well, we're not even know, at good or truth yet. I'm trying to figure out why we need obligations. Well, no, truth comes truth has comes into you know, it is a true statement that and again, this you have this foundational picture. I do, because I'm trying to get to the foundation of the argument. But, but it's not it's not it's not a found the the mind is not a found it's it's a web, right? So things just need to be coherent with each other. They have to map up with one another in a way that is purely coherent and rational, okay? So truth, goodness, they are not defined one after the other. It's defined in one sweeping succession. That's why I say they're two sides of the same coin. Can't you literally play this with any two things if you wanted to tie concepts together? Couldn't you web together almost anything like this? <sighs> no, because again, if you look at the way that we go about establishing, for example, the necessity of the principle of contradiction, right? by implicitly stating that it is a part of ration because rationality itself is, is 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 tied with it is obligation how rationality just sounds it, descriptive to me what does rationality mean to you so rationality to me implies certain incredibly basic like i don't know if you i don't know if you would say epistemic truths but like um, fuck, there was a word for these statements, but like, um, like these foundational beliefs. So like the law of identity, the law of non-contradiction, the law of the excluded middle, that these things are like part of like rationality, things like deductive statements, that these are like part of rationality that like any human being should be that, like necessarily adheres to because it's inconceivable that any human mind that shares our experience could think outside of these things. That's what rationality means to me, I guess. Right, right. Okay. Okay. So you, you, so you acknowledge the idea that rationality is about the very basis of human cognition in the first place. Yes. Okay. And in this sense, we are going to be bounded by it. Of right? course. But we also recognize the fact that we are finite beings and we are perfect. Perfect? So our conscious, our conscious wait, 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 wait. thought What does process, that mean? That means we are not always going to make absolutely correct decisions. Or wait, judgment. oh, I'm sorry. You said we're imperfect. No, I said we we are not perfect. Oh, I didn't. The not caught out on the mic. It sounded like you said oh, we're finite beings. Yeah. Okay, I don't know what um I don't know what finite beings. Why do we have to? What does this have to do with anything? Why are we saying because, this? Because because the fact that we are finite means that we are going to make errors in our judgments. Okay, so we're imperfect. So I I understand that we're right. rational, but that right. we are we are rational but imperfect. And so in a certain sense, I guess you could say we are not achieving peak rationality, right? Um, I don't know if I agree with that. I have to think about that a lot. Hold on. When you say Why that the fact when, so when you say that we are rational, but we're imperfect, so we're not always rational. One of those sounds to me like rational with a capital R, and the other one sounds like rational in a layman sense. So when you say that we are rational in the ways that like the law of identity and the law of non contradiction and the law of the excluded middle are just a priori truths that humans are granted with via cognition that cannot be broken, I would never say that we're imperfect as far as those truths go. Now, if we're talking about like some lower order statements where we might be imperfect or quote unquote irrational, I don't think we can ever be irrational insofar as those fundamental like truth law, law of truths goes. Does that make, is there a difference between those two things? Does that make sense? I, I mean, ultimately, rationality entails like certain normative standards that like rationality cannot be divorced from normativity is really like at the root of this. It, it brings with it normative considerations like coherence among a certain set of beliefs that we have. Uh, it brings with us, you know, I don't disagree with that. I don't think rationality okay. with the capital so, R that are like laws of truths. Yeah. With them, you should it should be a short hop and a skip from from rational like laws of truth over to mm -hmm. normative statements. I think I agree with that. Right. Okay. Right. So th that that's really where the that's where the hop comes. That's where we begin to. But that jump itself, that is where this idea of goodness comes from. Why? How? 
because goodness, okay, is going to be conformity with rationality. Because I reject, for example, these naturalistic claims about goodness, right? But like, I think example, I, it's in conformity with rationality is inconceivable and is just as meaningless as asking if we ought to consider the absurd. No, but it's not. In, no, no, but we are. We are not always purely rational agents. But we are. We know that we aren't. We ha we like, absolutely are. If we're talking about rational, like, our faculties are. We are right? in ca hold on. If we're talking about the a priori rationality that's granted to us, it is impossible to ever be irrational in, in so, insofar as those a priori truths go. It is impossible for a person to think of a contradictory thought, for, to think like it, it is impossible yes. for somebody to conceive yes. of something that is both taller and shorter than yes. something else. Yeah. Yes. So no, that so people so people are but, never irrational but, in in that sense. But we can have beliefs towards certain propositions and hold that they are both true even though it is impossible for our cognition to actually hold them both to be true. So in this sense, it's it's like an intentional type of relationship that we have so, towards certain sets of beliefs, right? And that's what okay. rationality I'm gonna, ties I'm, in. Okay, that's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that's what rationality is. Okay, hold on, hold on. Um, <clears throat> rationality is going to be conformity, in a sense, with the very necessity of human experience with the set of beliefs that we do have. Okay, so, uh, okay, ah, uh, fuck. Okay, so when we talk about, like, rationality, okay, I believe that all humans, a priori, are endowed with, with, some, with some truths. It must be, right? We agree on that, correct? Absolutely. Now, we agree that it might be possible that, um, that somebody might say one is less than two, two is less than three, but three is greater than one. That would be an irrational statement, correct? I, like... Yeah, yeah, let's just say yes, right? Because okay, sure. I mean, you can have all these competing mathematical. Sure, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, we, within Euclidean yes. geometry and all the whatever bullshit, yeah, okay, yeah, normal yeah, understanding yeah. of numbers. But, okay, so that, that's, but remember when I tried to bring this up, you said, "Well, no, no." So okay, sure. So somebody might say one is less than two, two is less than three, three is greater than one. Yes, and that, we might call that "quote unquote" irrational, right? Right, because that belief that they have towards that proposition uh -huh. is not actually reflective. Of sure. the way that the human mind operates. But I don't know if I would say that this is irrational in the same sense that humans are endowed with rationality. Because I don't think a person could truly hold this thought in their head. That something can be both greater than and less than another thing simultaneously. That they're, they haven't broken their endowed human rationality and become irrational. I they, see. I see what you're saying. So you are, you're drawing attention. I, I, I think this is an important distinction to make between oh this is what oh i see this is what you meant between like little r versus big r yeah okay so so which is which which cap which, which, is it little so when r we talk big about big r rationality i'm using capital r rationality i'm talking about like the law of non-contradiction the law of identity like the actual things that govern human experience that, that seem r. to be prerequisites to human experience that like you okay. are just up here endowed with these and that little okay. r rationality is like oh we've made an irrational statement but just because we made that irrational okay. statement doesn't mean we've broken that a priori human rationality, that's irrational in another sense, in a different context. That's like Got way it. down okay. the road. I yeah. understand what you're saying. Now. No, no, I would say rationality is the conformity of beliefs with those necessary conditions. So I... I that wait, wait, that's fine. Hold on, hold on. We can say that rationality is the conformity of beliefs um, with, uh, with necessary preconditions. We can say that if we want. But my, my only problem, though, is that when you use that earlier statement, we ought to adhere to rationality, because that's what I asked you, ought we adhere to rationality or, not, or irrationality or whatever, right? Is it felt like we were referring to both of these concepts, whereas I feel like rationality... Well, sense, but you do understand, like, how in a sense we are, because... Like well, rationality, but, I, yeah. but is, what I'm is, saying is that like we ought to adhere to we ought to adhere to our a priori beliefs. That's just a descriptive statement to me. Well, I don't understand not, how that's normative. That's literally just they, it is what we do. We can't do not do that. It's just descriptive. What? No, no. So, but rationality is that next step in saying that because we are finite, imperfect beings, imperfect beings, we are not always going to be able to necessarily be. Um, be conscious of and absolutely perfect in adhering and recognizing these necessary conditions that do govern our so on a day-to-day -day basis, like you said, I someone could be out there making claim that one is less than two or one is greater than two, two is greater than three, and three is greater than one, right? Someone could be saying that. That is irrational because rationality itself is the relationship between a set of beliefs with the necessary conditions or the necessary truths that govern human experience. That is what I mean by rationality. And that's why I think rationality is essentially normative. So, but 
I, I understand what you're saying that by I just I guess weird. I feel like I'm just trying not to get lost. It's a some it, it's a it feels like the rationality is it's it, I don't know how to specifically describe these necessary conditions because they are in a sense the basis of rationality, right? That's that's why so I can understand why that that is yeah, it is confusing. Um that's a a slippery semantic issue. But like the, it, that's it's why not, I like that they are I think that there's a big difference. Do you agree God that there is a w. big difference between a priori like knowledge versus what we call rationality in terms of believing like in terms of a person having a contradictory belief do we like or do you think these people have actually well, found a way to escape well like human rationality i guess well no so but uh, this is where normativity arrives from normativity arrives from being rational like rationality is a normative concept but i thought we just said rationality has to come before normativity this is what i mean is that so the, the the concepts like the necessary conditions for experience ground out rationality right like that's the basis of rationality that's what all of our beliefs have to conform to right okay. but the concept of rationality itself to say that something is rational is to always bring with this claim that you ought to be rational like that's it, it it's it's a constraint on on certain sets of belief that they ought to cohere to, they have to be consistent. They have to cohere to these necessary conditions. Yada yada yada. That's that is why it is is normative. But it's always in reference to these necessary conditions of human experience. I, I, I guess, but like that sounds like a statement that would just be axiomatic and unjustified. Like we ought to be rational doesn't sound like uh, so, some, like that. Just sounds like, like a statement to be foundational. Like destiny. Like again, it is impossible in a sense to refute the ultimate skeptic. Right. Every philosopher believes this of right okay. but you have acknowledged that we can't transcend the bounds of human experience okay right so you have already in a sense acknowledged you shouldn't really be having any issues with this sense of axiomatic necessities right like you've already acknowledged that in a sense they are quite literally necessary and they can't be doubted in the first place so i i'm not totally sure what the issue is me neither rem Listen, I love you, okay? Look, this was a good conversation. I mean, we explored a we lot. We did, I think. but I believe everything I believed before this conversation. I don't think you're going to Well, no, really I mad. don't think you do, because you, if if we if you were to actually go back and analyze that bot, okay. you, you jumped around a lot, right? Okay. And I don't know if it was a conscious decision by you, but your position and the arguments you were giving did keep changing. I, I guess I, I, because I feel like what we're referring to is, is different. And I'm trying to figure out sometimes what you're referring to sometimes. I mean, it, it's working out the thought process that you, I think you have this intuitive notion that you're trying to like hammer down on, but you sort of keep missing. And I'm, I'm just sort of narrowing you in on your ultimate issue. But the arguments that you have made to me previously are not like, they aren't correct arguments. And I've shown you why they aren't. Okay. So I still have no idea out. how morality needs to presuppose like all rationality i haven't gotten to that yet i well again the, this this comes from normativity and the normativity. i don't understand why but it's, i see like, the normativity so look, coming very easily from rationality i don't see why you need morality to, to get to normativity from rationality because what is morality well morality i thought morality referred to, to like what morality is what we ought to do but an ought statement could just be a normative one and not a moral one it, what is the difference the difference is that a moral statement is usually the truth of a moral statement is usually evaluated in in reference or coherence to some uh, moral fact, whereas a normative it's, statement is usually mm, just like. What do you mean by moral fact? So if I were to evaluate the psychologist the doesn't believe in sure. moral. Sure. So fact. let's say that I let's say I were to evaluate the statement. Um, in order to run a hundred yards, I need to run a uh, hundred yards. In order to run hundred yards, dash in it right. That like these are statements that we could measure and, and things could be just be descriptively true, and we don't Wait, need. So to, sorry. Before we go on, like yeah. I just I want to highlight here that this. What I'm pressing on here is ultimately my my argument for the normative web. Okay, that's fine. That so any type, I just I'm no, yeah. Go for it. That's fine. Go for it. Stay on track. Okay. Yeah. So I would say that like normative statements. Oh fuck! What was I saying before? Oh, okay. Oh, so I'm a sorry. normative statement. No, no, it's okay. It's okay. A normative statement. I need to run a hundred yards in order to run the hundred yard dash. Okay. That that statement can be evaluated. That it comports with true facts of the world. That you can one hundred percent evaluate the, the truth value of that statement. Right. So I refers to a person. Um, need. It, that's a verb. Like requires like an order to do something. Um, run is an action. One hundred yards refers to a specific set of distance. But in order to complete a race, that refers to that, like it's almost yeah. That like that is like just like that's a true statement. But that normative statement can be evaluated and can be true descriptively. But but that every single description 
descriptive thing refers to like a fact or feature of the world. But if I were to say something like murder is wrong, that statement can't be evaluated would... because the wrong part that refers to some sort of moral fact that can't be seen anywhere. You're you're you're, you're presupposing though. Uh, you're you're presupposing naturalistic a naturalistic conception of ethics. Okay, right. what other conception of ethics like, could there be? What do you mean? Like a deontological one. Which, that, that doesn't have anything to do with moral facts or something about the world. And what does that have to do with? Well, because in a sense, I mean, because literally for Kant, uh, morality is rooted in rationality. Morality is directly derived or attempted. Like, I don't believe his attempt is successful, right? I mean, Korsgaard has attempted to correct it. Parfit has attempted to correct it, right? Yada, yada. But it derives from the very you know, limits of rationality. That's where morality comes from. So you are imposing, you're sort of presupposing this conception of, of morality, one that comes from virtue ethics or or utilitarianism, or I guess egoism, that I, I okay. just completely- I So mean, you're that, telling me- can't appeal and to I, that I, and I'm not trying that to, basis. Okay, I'm not trying to get you, because I genuinely don't know. You're yeah. telling me that like Kant or whatever would say that like, there is no such thing as like moral fact, that there are no Absolutely. moral- Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So, so when Kant well, talks about moral fact, realism and he talks about like right just, or wrong, he's just saying that like you're clear, they're irrational. Fact, yeah, you're referring to a state of affairs in the world, right? Sure. Yeah. That then like no, yeah, he would absolutely reject that. That like murder being wrong is not like a, that. That doesn't refer to like a moral fact anywhere, but that you have to use yes. rationality or whatever to arrive at that. Yes. Okay. That's how you get the categorical imperative. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. Well, we're gonna hang our hat right here, and okay. we'll revisit this one in the future. Okay. okay. That's, look, this was a good discussion. I'm, I'm, I'd like to do this more sometimes. I think, uh, our, you know, our wires get crossed. We miss it. But I always enjoy our conversation. Sure. So. I do too, Rem. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I love you. Have a good night, dude. Okay. Be careful. All right. Adios. Bye. Fuck philosophy and fuck metaethics. I'm the ultimate skeptic. I don't believe any metaethics are real. And I think that all ought statements are fucking bullshit. Okay. Just to be clear. What happens when feelings go away? Um, I mean, a lot of things could happen. <laughs> um, I mean, like the two most common...